All right, so how's everybody doing today? All right, so let's play a little code golf, right? So this talk is like the zen of writing bad code. And we'll kind of get into that here in a second. But so uh, code golf, it is, it's like, you now it's like traditional golf where uh, we have these problems, we'll call those holes, you know, a problem to solve. And then uh, uh, each character, like doing as few characters as possible, like each character becomes a stroke. So basically the lower score, the better. So if we can find, solve some problems in as few strokes as possible, that's code golf. And I'm gonna do a lot of my referencing. So I guess, why code golf? Because it's fun. Like it's solving problems and challenges in ways, in, in unique ways. Uh, each code golf hole is not always a real hard challenge, but it lets you exercise some of your code solving muscles that aren't the same as like your install scripts or running in servers. Like it's using PowerShell and solving problems in a slightly different way than you're probably running into you know, day to day. Um, and code golf actually pushes you to find like creative solutions. Sometimes the most elegant solution or the most optimal solution might not be the fewest characters. So sometimes you can actually do things in a really bad way, but you can do so to have like fewer characters in for the, for the, for the challenge. And, uh, and as you dive into it, you find clever ways to use PowerShell like it was never intended. Like you'll see some weird things that like, can it really do that? Yes, it does. I, and I, in fact, I discovered things about PowerShell by doing code golf just by trying and experimenting. Like, hey, how can I steal a character here? And yeah, I felt like I was like breaking the language as I was doing it. Uh, on the more practical side, uh, it's good code interview uh, practice. Like as you're getting more and more advanced in your PowerShell, you're gonna find jobs that are thinking they're more PowerShell development type jobs and they're wanting you to do like a coding challenge and maybe even whiteboard a small problem. And it's these types of problems that tend to be those um, used in those types of interviews. And then, and then it's fun to use an existing skill set in just a new way. Like I've used PowerShell for so long and this is just a new way to use a skill I already did to solve, um, solve different types of problems. Uh, one code golf site in particular is actually code.golf. Um, I like this site for code golfing because it supports lots of languages. So it's not just PowerShell, we got Python, Bash, even SQL, if that's a language that you're, you're using. Uh, they've got a good selection of holes that they're adding quite often, these like pull requests. So if you come up with a clever hole or suggestion, you, know, you, you can drop it in there. And what's really nice about this site is it does code execution and validation. So with that, when you think you've solved the problem, you can submit your code and it'll run it in like a container somewhere and, and check the output for the results and score your entry. Uh, and because it's doing that, it also has a leaderboard. So if you get competitive, you can kind of see how you rank against other people on a per language or even a per hole basis. Like I'm, I'm like number seven on the list, but Part of my high score is because I've just done lots of the holes. Like if you actually got good at some of these holes, you could probably beat my score up there. So there's the first challenge to, to everyone in here. Uh, but the big disclaimer is just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should, right? We're gonna see a couple weird quirks in PowerShell. Uh, when I write my articles, I like to go really in depth on topics. And sometimes there's these oddities that I don't want to tell people about because they might actually use it. <laughs> so there's some stuff in here like uh, professional code is you know clean, easy to read, right? You're going to spend so much more time reading code than you will writing it, and it's a, just a very different skill set. So you will learn some gems in here, but there will be some things that I don't want to see in your production code. And like I said, code golf is none of that clean, you know, easy to run, easy to test code. So. With that, let's jump into some weird nuances and uh, work our way towards some problems. So the very basics with code.golf is like any output counts, right? So your right host or right output um, for checking your results, uh, it's actually just as good as just putting a string on the, on the pipeline so it falls to the console. So we may as well just put the string out there for it to be read as the output, 
just a hello world versus trying to say write host or write output. Like there is already, you know, uh, 10 or so characters you can save just by uh, not specifying write host. One nuance uh, in my notation here is that I'm going to notate some of these nuances with the output. So I'm using this designation here to say that uh, this line will output the dates in this format, or this line here will output this number. Um, that'll help when I've got several things compared so you kind of see the output from some commands versus me trying to run each one individually. But I'll still run a few of these here to capture output. So the first place we can steal a lot of characters in PowerShell is white space. Um, so in a nice command like, say, this, right, like professional code is indented, you know, multi-lines, easy to read, but cool golf, golf, we just steal all that white space out, put it on one line. Um, if you're doing your challenges in VS Code, you can actually hop over here to like settings, the, the settings.json, and set your white space rendering to all. And now, when you're looking at the challenges, you can actually see these little dots in here that will indicate where your white space is. Um, so looks at, let's look at a couple places where we can steal some white space. First off, in math, right? Operators, uh, we can just take all of your equations and just scrunch those things right together. We don't have to have any spaces between um, multiplication or division or, or, or uh, even if they're variable names. Since these symbols aren't valid names in a variable, it, the parser identifies these as separate operators. So yeah, we can just shove all this stuff together. Uh, and in the pipeline, like these you probably already know, right? Like in the pipeline, we can rob these spaces, uh, you know, from our for each, or on each side of the pipeline, and use an alias here, and we just saved a ton of characters for our for loop here, where we don't need any white space. So, that's, these are probably things you probably ran into before, probably common, you know, uh, uh, um, 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 trick you probably already be aware of, but then we start getting into the more of the weird ones, where, um, condition expressions, uh, like comparisons. Like, I didn't realize that I didn't need to put a space here between the five and the beginning of this comparison, or literally directly after. So here's two spaces you just don't need. And if they're variables, same story holds because, like I said, they're not valid uh, characters in a variable. Oh, it does. <laughs> And that's kind of why I call this bad code. You're going to stare at some code like, what is going on there? And we can also like chain these operators together, right? Like if you have like an and statement in there, like this gets ugly fast, and you can do it. This is perfectly valid PowerShell. <laughs> Don't do this in production. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just that we can channel this stuff together, and the order of operations still holds true. So. Uh, these will evaluate, be evaluated appropriately. So if I run this one, for example, uh, get a fate, you know, I'll get true on that line. All right, so then the next place that kind of threw me for a loop that I discovered white space was optional was with the join, split, and replace because they're actually operators as well. So if you look at your join statement, like we don't actually need the space between your variable and the join or directly after the join. So there's like two spaces that, yep, we can get rid of those uh, super fast. And then a clever nuance with the join statement is that if you actually put your array after the join and you just want everything concatenated together, it will just join everything into a single string. So if I have like say a whole bunch of characters and I need them to be in a word or a string, you can just say join and your array and it dumps these guys into just a single uh, uh, string versus if you just do the array and like say quotes, you'd probably have uh, like a space between them by default. So there's a little nuances that um, uh, come in handy. Uh, but this extends to the other ones too, right? So if I do split, you know, key value pairs, I don't need spaces on either side of the splits, and same holds true for the replace operator. Um, clever nuance about the replace operator is that this empty space thing here at the end, oh, oh, go back, go back, is actually optional as well. So you can actually use this line here 
to delete characters. Like you don't actually need to say what to replace it with if there's nothing to replace it. It's replacing it with null, which is nothing, and it works out beautiful. So here, let's run this one. So, the, so really, the tip is start deleting stuff. Like if you're doing code golf and you're like, does this even need to be here? Just start taking it out, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it didn't. Like these are all things I discovered through code golf, experimenting with the language. And then you can also chain these. This is ugly as well, but I can replace the dash, and then I can do replace directly after it. And you know what? Numbers, I don't need quotes around those. So I could, I could remove both the dashes and the number five from this number in that ugly line of code. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Well, that's the end of the white space. I'm actually gonna turn this white face setting off. So I find it kind of distracting at times. So what are we doing next? I think I'm doing iterations. No, oh, arrays of strings, okay. So here, okay, I got some fun tricks here. Okay, so here's how I might define array in production code. You know, very uh, verbose, lots of white space, easy to read. Of course, we can definitely put these on a single line and it's, they're still valid arrays. Uh, but, you know, these quotes take up a lot of space. What if we didn't need to put the quotes there? Well, there's this fun trick you can do with write output that you can just put your strings in a line without the quotes and you've got an array of strings. So now when I run this, I've got first, second, third. And we've got a handy alias for write output called echo. Remember the thing we're never supposed to use or don't use anymore? Yeah, it's really handy. Um, I actually use this one on the shell from time to time when I just have like a list of values I've pulled off a website or something. I just do echo to get it into a string and there we go. So this saves, so especially in this case, right? I've got, uh, here I've got what, six quotes in this line? And echo is just, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five characters. So, so as soon as I cross three items, it's, fewer characters to use echo than it is to have just an array of, array of strings defined there. Sure. Uh, yes, so the really advanced tip, if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll remind me to loop back to it. But can you like put a script block into a single variable and just execute that script block multiple times? So a two character variable for your script, you know, a dollar equals your command as a script block and you can do dots or ampersand to run that multiple times as you need to or even recursively recall that. But anyways, I'm, I'm getting off tangent here. I don't know if I'll get that deep. Uh, uh, in here. Uh, another trick which is handy in certain situations is like here I've got spaces. So maybe you can just put them together and split them. Like here's where something get creative. If I have a lot of text for some challenges you do, um, one example is like the um, uh, 12 days of Christmas, like reproducing that. They've got lots of text in that to work with. And I use the split trick to uh, basically, I've got like, I don't know, 12 or so lines. I get rid of quotes on each line, I can just have, a, have, a, have an operator and split it. Uh, but yeah, creative case by case scenarios. But one creative thing is I can choose whatever delimiter I want and we already know I don't need quotes around numbers. So if I can shove a number in there, I just save two characters by not using an actual character, I just use a number there and it PowerShell took care of that. Uh, Excellent, okay. Ooh, here's another one that I discovered by accident. Here strings, right? So if you're doing multi-line strings, we use this the yeah, symbol here to you know, do your quotes and you have your multi-line string. Well, I discovered that PowerShell supports multi-line strings by default. I don't need that, the ampersand before or after. This here is a valid string. Now it's fragile, like if somebody drops a quote in here, it breaks, but 
I could do quotes around a multi line string and have the term lines in there and they're all valid um, as a string. So, still, I recommend do the here string in production, but uh, if you need to save a couple characters. The other nuance here with the multi line string is uh, the, uh, the new lines here aren't part of the string. So, you do a here string from here to here, it's actually just saying these three lines are the here string. So, when you're doing this trick, uh, remember to just, you know, slide that last quote up there so you don't have like an extra return um, if that's what you're needing for your data set. And then, uh, same story, if you have multiple lines, you can always split on the new line if, if that fits for the problem you're trying to solve. Um, uh, oh, variables. Okay, so there's a feature of variables called deconstruction that some people know about, but it's kind of more obscure, so it's not super common. And the idea of deconstruction is like, here's how you normally assign a variable. I got a variable on the right, assign it to the, to the value on the left. Well, deconstruction actually allows you to actually assign multiple values at once, and PowerShell will say, hey, I can put the first value in the first variable and the second value in the second variable. So this guy is actually quite, quite clever and handy in, in some cases. Um, in fact, uh, if you're looking for a reason to use, use this one in production, like splitting an email address off of a, like this, this is an example I've used before, is right, I've, I've got a string, I'm splitting it in half to get the username and the domain separate. I can just assign them directly. I don't have to like index into the array to figure out which one is zero and one. I just assign them in this way. So yeah, so when I run this uh, F8, and I get Kevmar on this line, and Gmail on this line. So that one's super fun. Ooh, assigning extra values. So another nuance is that, uh, that if you have more variables than you have values, that the first value will go into the first one and everything else, so like two through six here, will get shoved into the second variable. It's like, it's like a catch-all for everything that comes after it. So, like in code golf, if you need to have, if you need to like skip the first one in a list, sometimes you can actually just shove them into two variables and throw away the first variable because the rest shows up um, after that. Um, oh, then uh, here's kind of a, okay, this one's definitely like a dirty hack in that uh, if I'm trying to assign, you know, say I'm like inside of a loop and I need to like clear out a variable, right? I got a variable I want assigned to null. Um, I actually, I could use a fake variable here that's not defined, right? So if I haven't defined z to anything, that's assigning to null. Well, I can actually combine this to a single line and put the second one here. So in a way, I'm actually assigning a and null to these two variables, and I've just shaved like three characters in a very dirty way here. <laughs> Don't do this in production. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, and then the, the other little trick is you can actually use this to swap variables, right? So instead of doing, oh, I need to put this in a temp variable and juggle these two and use the temp variable back to the first one, we can just swap them. Just assign the first and the second and uh, PowerShell will, yeah, we'll just get this guy to go over there and this guy over here. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a one line swap, one operation. Uh, if you're doing the Fibonacci challenge, this tip really helps. Uh, da -da -da -da. And chaining assignments. So if I need to get the same value in lots of things, you can just assign them right after each other. One equals two equals three and, and the value and all of them will walk away with the value. With the value. Uh, so, yeah, so I think, yeah, so that's um, one place I use this is if I've got like, I know I'm in a loop where I got a number coming in, I need to manipulate it a little bit, but I also need the base number, like there's times where I will uh, like assign a value coming in to multiple things so I can manipulate them in different ways in, in crazy algorithms. But yeah, this A equals B equals C uh, is, is super handy that way. Okay, this one here is also a really odd quirk of PowerShell that is super handy in code golf. 
And that is, like, when you do an assignment, like n equals a, there is no output on that, right? I don't get anything as, as a return value. Um, but if I actually put parentheses around it, I get that value back and I can use it for, and, and do stuff with it. So here, if I run this, I'm gonna get a back as a value I can do things with. So I'm gonna combine this with something here in a moment, but so I use this in all kinds of challenges. Um, actually, where this is super handy is if you're defining a variable and then like using it somewhere else, like several times, like the first place you use it, you could actually like define it in line and use the parentheses to use the value. So that's one way to condense characters in a, uh, and so this is really ugly code. <laughs> We do that, and I've got an example later that we'll see this in action. Um, and then adding one is super common. So, uh, you know, it goes to the n plus one, and plus equals one, right, adds one to the n variable. Uh, one that's less common, but not, not too obscure is, we've got n plus plus, and you can actually do plus plus n. Both of these are adding one to the value, and I'm gonna show you the, the actually the nuance between these two, but these, these are equivalent of 193, 194, 195, 196, they're, as they're used here, effectively equivalent. So, this before and after, this is kind of a difficult concept that for people to wrap their head around, so um, I don't blame you if this does walk away confusing even after I explain it. But, uh, when you use these in, in, in a equation, so this J++ actually means, give me the value of J, then add one to the variable, and I'll, use, and I'll use this value inside the equation. So it's give me the value, then add one, and I'll, I'll work with it. Where this k++ is add one to the value, then give it to me, and I can use it in the equation. So as I look at this here, so both of these are defined as value one. So I get j equals one, one plus 20 is 21, but j is added for the next time it's referenced it'll be two. Where in this line, k is added one, k becomes two, two plus 20 is 22. It makes your brain hurt, definitely. Uh, but there are weird nuances in algorithms when you're coding a challenge that this comes in handy. Because when they're both done, they're both j. So it's like, in that specific moment, do I need the value it was, or the value I want it to be? And that's kind of the nuance there. What? It did. It wants. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Let's put that back. 21. <laughs> All right, how, how crazy can we go? Can we go plus plus on a plus? Okay, it doesn't work. Doesn't work. <laughs> this is me and Code Golf. I'm like, what if? Like, let's just try it. Let's throw something in there. Yeah, well, we just do both here. <laughs> All right, we're, we're uh, getting into some fun weeds here. But basically, play, test, experiment until it works, and then just don't touch it again, right? That's the. <laughs> All right. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay, so inside of an algorithm, it will, I'll get the value and I can work with it. Uh, there's other places where if I just run J++ plus plus or N++ plus plus by itself, it's an assignment and I don't get the value back, right? So if up here, if I do like N equals zero, if I run that, F8, and I do N++, plus plus, for whatever reason in PowerShell, I don't actually get the value as, as a return value. It's, it's not put on the pipeline. But I can combine that with that other trick a little bit ago that says, well, let's actually just put these on the pipeline after I assign them. So the thought process is, 
do I need to use that value here after I've done the assignment? And is it not in an algorithm? So anyways, like I said, you, you gotta play with an experiment with it. Uh, what else? Okay, iterations. All right, so we got you know, four each, one in 100. Uh, it's super common iteration. Uh, we have the for loop, right? It's the, you initialize something to a value, you do your, your condition, and then you increment and, and, and do, whatever, do whatever with it. Like this is super common to use in, 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 in algorithms. Because you can actually, uh, uh, usually you can like add one, you, you can get like the values before and after when, when using this. But the, the whole reason why I brought this one up is, this is a really weird command. Like if you really want to push this thing to the limits and discover that those second sections are all optional. <laughs> in fact, even those are optional. So your smallest possible for... <laughs> so if you want a forever loop, yeah, it's shorter than while one. So, so I'm branding it here, forever loop. <laughs> uh, oh, no, I can break that. <laughs> but yeah, so it's what? Oh, it's easily four or three characters shorter than the while one. Uh, in fact, if you just want to you know, mess the field's mind, you can just say, you know, for ever? Ever, ever? No. <laughs> uh, da -da -da. Okay, so beyond that, but what I find is like the shortest, tightest loop is actually just doing your numbers and piping it into, into the pipeline. Uh, much shorter than the for each or the, uh, the traditional for loop. In fact, I got this guy down here, like 12 characters, um, and uh, end up, I'm using this pattern all the time. Because they, they always say, you know, do like the first 100 whatever, first 100 Fibonacci, first whatever prime numbers, um, first 100 Fizzbuzz. In fact, with that, let's go look at our first actual example here. So we're going to actually deep dive into Fizzbuzz. And uh, if you haven't heard this one, it's the challenge is like from 1 to 100, print all the numbers, except if it's uh, divisible by 3, print fizz, if it's divisible by five, print buzz, and if it's divisible by both, print fizz buzz, right? So here's an example of the output here on the right. So we're basically gonna write, um, um, this is a pretty famous example of a coding challenge for an interview. It's like, it's almost like, almost a parody at this point that it's so common. But, oh, I didn't wanna do that. Uh, let's jump into the code. All right. Fizzbuzz, um, effectively recreate the instructions in here, example outputs. Uh, I am making use of the modulus operator, uh, super common in, in, in math algorithms. Um, uh, but you, might, you might already know this one, right? But if you, modulus is like when you're doing division and it's the remainder. So if I divide something by two, modulus tells me the remainder. So here, you know, zero divided by two, remainder zero, one divided by two is remainder of one, three divided by two is remainder of one. And so this is a way to do like even odds, right? If it's even, it's this, if it's odds, it's that. So actually, here's, yeah, here's my example. So if the value is zero, it is evenly divisible. So we're gonna throw in a first pass, and uh, uh, actually, can I get this guy to fit? So here's, here's a first pass. So, when I'm doing code golf, I will get a solution and I'll do it clean, I'll use good variable names because I'm gonna muck with the algorithm a bit in a way that I can read it and work with it. So, let's actually see this guy run. Actually, no, so I'll start with it. So, the, uh, so I, I kinda started the case where like, hey, if it's both, we're doing, is it divisible by three? Yes, and is it divisible by five? We got fizz buzz. If it's divisible by three, we got fizz. If it's divisible by five, buzz. This is very inefficient, but this solves the, the, qu the question, right? So let's have a solution. And we're gonna jump over into the code golf site uh, here. Oh, that's supposed to be code golf. Or the, uh, there it is, thank you. All right, so here's the site. So here's what the challenge looks like where they give you the, you know, the, the details of the challenge. You can actually jump between languages. Your current score and the ones around you are on the right over here. And then when you run it, uh, it will execute. And we get this green smiley face when everything works. So here I've got one that's working. Now if you, 
uh, have you know like a, like an extra character somewhere, or let's say we're getting like a space between this, right? It's going to do the the check and tell you, oh, your input and output don't quite match. Uh, one fun tip is just to come in here, and just hit run right away. Like if you're not sure what they're actually expecting out of you, we can just hit run, and now the expected gives me something to figure out what I'm trying to actually do. Uh, this is especially important when they're doing stuff like the 12 days of Christmas. They might want like a white space, a line, extra line between, or, right? So know what you're trying to solve for, just go grab the output. In fact, a uh, fun tip, we can actually solve his buzz here. I do this and grab uh, here, and I grab everything. Oh, we missed some. Oh, come on. Uh, one, two, right here. All right, got a slight little bit of overlap, so I need to drop the, I delete from here to here. All right. Uh, so, we can actually just say, well, if I put a quote here, and a quote here, I've got a valid answer to this problem. Works. <laughs> Not very efficient, mind you. Uh, but I have more than one thing solved on here just like this. So, uh, yeah, but okay, back to, the, back to the actual challenge. So, uh, right away, I know I'm repeating logic here, right? That's just, we can do better, we can do better. So let's take a second, a second attempt at this. Here's something a little bit more like somebody might write, where I'm saying, okay, let's have a value that, I, uh, like that, that I'm appending to. So in the case where I'm a multiple of three, I'll add fizz to my value. If multiple of five, I add buzz, which means if I multiple both, I got both values. And then I check our value to see if I have something in there to decide do I return the number or the, the, the magic result that we've been passing around. Okay, so now I got a working solution that I feel like, okay, this is an algorithm I can work with. Like I can now start chipping away at some of our white space. Sorry. Uh, so I'm, starting to, I'm, I'm gonna drop my variable names and compress some of these lines, right? So this is the same code, except I changed to one single character variable names, right? That's wasted characters if you're having long variable names in your actual challenge submission. And I wrapped my lines so that some of the stuff is in a single line. And I, so I can kind of see what I'm working with here. Um, some of this stuff I'm kind of leaving in place for now just so it's easier to read on the, in, during the presentation. So I'm leaving this indented so we can kind of see some of these things. So uh, don't be screaming at me like, hey, you, there's a tab indent there. I'll, we'll get that later, we'll get that. Okay, so I'm gonna start attacking this piece here. I feel like there's room for improvement in this if logic. So, ooh, ooh I take that back. I'm getting off a little bit. Let's do our for each. Because I already said that I know there's a, all right, we can do the pipeline here, right? So I'll take my algorithm. In this case, I know for each is kind of my answer. You know, using my aliases, remove the white space, right? There's 25 characters of 12. Excellent, nice, easy, low hanging, low hanging fruit. So here's our example, you know, with our, using the pipeline. So now I'm gonna tackle our if conditions. So let's look at other ways we can do this. Uh, first off, I'm gonna pull this assignment out because we can do you know, the if value and assign it back to a variable because I think this is the core piece we're actually trying to solve for. And uh, this is where I'm gonna start looking at the ternary operator, right? PowerShell 7 and Code Golf runs PowerShell 7 when it's doing the challenges. We have the ternary which lets you do a, a condition, right? This condition, and if this is true or false, we get the true value or the false value. Uh, and it's beautiful for code golf. So looking at our example here, if uh, our number is divisible by three, and that's equal to zero, true, it's divisible by three, you know, we get our fizz, if not, we get uh, an empty string, or I put a null in there just as well. Um, uh, but this guy is a little bit expensive, because I actually see, we're still using this equal check for zero, and uh, you know what? If something is divisible by three, right, number divided by three, it, I get the values of zero, one, or two, and zero is divisible, 
I get the result of zero when it is divisible by three, which means that's kind of like a true false value, right? Zero is a false and anything else is a true. So we can actually just use that in our logic here. So let's do that more directly so that this becomes our, our true false statement. If this is divisible by, by, by three is a zero, but that doesn't mean I need to flip my other operators, right? Because now I'm, I'm looking for, I want false to give me the fizz and anything else, give me nothing. So here's an example of if it's a one, I get nothing. If it's a zero, I get fizz. All right, but uh, those that have been around PowerShell for a while, while there is this old school ternary approach that we used before we actually had the ternary operator. And what I mean by that is, we could actually do some funky stuff with arrays to recreate that effect. Or if I have an array of two values and the condition is the index into that array, a true value is one and a false value is zero. So I can actually say, if this is false, give me the first one. And if this is true, uh, give me the second one. Uh, it's ugly, but <laughs> it works. Um, all right, but now we're looking at our specific problem, right? So if I dive in a little bit deeper, uh, I don't actually care so much. Oh, oh, don't want that, don't want that. I don't care so much about this null value. In fact, in here, I'm gonna get the values zero, which gives me the fizz, one or two, but they're nulls. I, I don't care, and in fact, I can actually index into a single array a million times and it gives me a null if it's not there, right? So here I'm actually doing, uh, if this is divisible by three, give me the value in this array. And it's kind of like a if false type statement. So here, the zero, I get fizz, one null, two null. So now I've like shrunk that whole if check thing down to this really obscure thing that I never want to see in production. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's very few characters. So back to our FizzBuzz example, and these two side by side, you know, we can kind of see how the top one versus the bottom one, we're starting to shift now where like, uh, it's getting more obscure and, and, and ugly to look at, but this is the phase we're at, is taking small pieces and finding a better solution for them. So while we're doing that, let's continue on. And these are two lines here, right? The if equals nothing are values, uh, return those. So, here, so I'm gonna actually initialize these values so I have something to work with. And then, all right, so here's what we're actually we're using in our, in, our, in, our, in our logic. But we just learned the ternary, let's experiment with that. So here, if r equals nothing, uh, give us the number, else give us back what, it, what our return value was. Um, but I'm doing this trick again. Like, isn't an empty string false, right? So let's get rid of this and just flip the values again. So now if I have a value, if there is a value there, uh, just return the value. If not, give me the number. In fact, if I actually show these more live here, F8, I get the, the numerical value because my R was empty and if I have actually fizz in there already, um, F8, I'm getting fizz back. Uh, so, if I remove the white space, this is like 10 characters. So there's a nuance here where uh, this is a valid variable name. So I gotta have a space there and this is valid in a variable name for like scoping. So I gotta have a space here. This is one of those spaces I just can't hear that space. So uh, we can experiment with the old ternary, uh, but I need to get that string into a Boolean. Like I actually need an actual true false there to actually you know, do my indexing trick. Um, and I can do a bool there, but that's ugly. I could not the value, so if I do like not r or not the value, I get true and falses. Um, I gotta change the values, but uh, it's a worthwhile experiment, but I'm already past 13 characters. So, I, I'm, so I'm, I'm gonna describe this, but I do these explorations just to figure out the nuances, right? So now we're at, with our ternary, 89 characters. Okay, so now, we start getting the phase where we start just like actually hacking. So, what, so once I got the algorithm like tight, I start like not caring about the algorithm so much, but how can I like abuse PowerShell and what I'm staring at? And here, I feel like we can combine all three of these lines. All right, is that what I actually do next? 
Yeah, I do. So I don't need to pre-sign this. Um, I can actually put these on the same line, right? Like there's no need to have those in separate lines. Excellent. So that, yeah, so there's, you know, white space, we're just whittling away. And that's what I have in this line. And then next, you know what, okay. We're getting really ugly at this point, so bear with me. This is gonna be hard to watch. But I'm defining this value and I'm using it right here. Remember I said we could do this trick where I say, let's define a value and use it. I can now delete this here and I've inlined that whole ugly thing and I've just saved a whole bunch of characters by doing that. And if we keep going now, I can bring this up here, I can finally get rid of this I never needed. And now I've got an inline, a true inline fizz buzz in 53 characters. Uh, this is the ugly code I was talking about <laughs> when I was saying uh, 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 it's ugly. So with that, but we can go smaller here, and I think I jumped ahead on a couple lines. Okay, so this is our one-liner as I've kind of manipulated it. Uh, so is that the best we can do? We can go a, down a different route. If we look at our, look at our, our, our trick here, uh, you can do some stuff with strings, where if I actually take fizz times one, I get fizz, or fizz times zero, I get empty string. So if I can get this into a mathematical equation where I'm doing it times one or zero, I get my value or not. So using this trick, I gotta do not here, because I actually need, <laughs> so I'll get a zero if it's a multiple, or if it's, if it's divisible, but I actually want a one, so I do not to flip it, and I take that times the value, in a weird way, I've saved like what, one character? <laughs> So, these are, so when you're starting to get down to the tiniest piece, you're doing the craziest acrobatics to save single characters and, and hopefully, you know, your insanity holds um, with you. Uh, so here's that same one using the string multiplication. So, okay, so is that the best we can do? Uh, I've got one more trick in here. And I'm, we're gonna backtrack a little bit, but uh, PowerShell added the null coalescing operator, right? What that means is, if you're doing this thing where you're saying, if the value is null, let's assign it to something, right? Well, in PowerShell, we've got this one liner that says, if this value is null, assign it to something. These, are, these two are equivalent. So PowerShell 7, this, and this guy has to be null, which is an important distinction here. But yeah, so it's a great way to assign values in nulls. And you can do it in line to where if you're saying, if value is null, give me default, as I assign it to something else. So, this is a lot sexier than our ternary we were using a little bit ago, right? Because now, if this guy is null, if this guy is null, I actually return my numeric value back. But if it's not, that's the value I get back. So right there, I'm saving a ton of characters. So, so this guy here, a really ugly one. Remember how we did this whole ugly thing with this whole R assignment? Let's just get rid of R. So I don't need R anymore. I don't need R anymore here. This guy here is a double question mark and I don't know the, those parentheses around it. And boom, we've got a 45 character fizz buzz. If we hop over into Code Golf. <laughs> I haven't though, that's the problem. <laughs> You can? Because yeah. that's what I'm looking for is somebody here has 42. Ah, uh, I've tried that, unfortunately. So I run this, because I'm really insane. I'm indexing into a string and not an array anymore. That's why those at signs are important in this specific solution. Uh, we end up with order of operations, so I can actually do this, because I actually need to index into an array. So this is my trap, this is my trap I'm stuck in, is I'm index, I can't index into the string. I actually need an array there. Yeah, so that's where I'm stuck. 
I would love to see the solutions that can beat this 45 because somebody can has obviously gotten 42. Can you no, you can't. So I, now I just share, I've just shared with you my best solution. And I've got this whole thing up on uh, GitHub. And with that, I think we're, we're right at time. But I did leave something else in here for you. If you do want to explore this on your own, um, I did add a very similar demo for 12 Days of Christmas in here where I break it down piece by piece just like I did FizzBuzz and it uses the tricks that I already explained in the talk. So there's no new magic in here almost, but for the most part, no new magic in here to do 12 Days of Christmas as a one, you know, to um, see that. So, uh, with that, I know we're at time, but I'll definitely hang out and take questions. So yeah, thank you for joining the session.